summer, we've t we're taking a break from the book of Acts. We've been in the book of Acts the last couple of years. It's been a fascinating study. But during the summer, we're, doing, so we're taking some topics, uh, most of, of discipleship. In other words, how do we become better followers of Jesus? Uh, kind of the end game for this is that more of you will get involved with a, a, what we call a micro group going through this book together called Discipleship Essentials. It's a book uh, by Greg Ogden. Uh, he did this as part of, you know, becoming a doctor. You know, there's a lot of research uh, that indicates that you and I don't really do so well by ourselves when we attempt to be followers of Jesus. That we, we really need people that we're involved with in the process. Others who are considering it an important thing to do in their lives and are doing it with us. Jesus, God created us for community. And, and if we are not involved with others who are taking this seriously in their lives, then the chances are we're not going to be taking it seriously either. And, and, and there's all kinds of research to back that up. If, if you want to follow Jesus and you want to do it all by yourself, best of luck. That's not how it was intended to work, ever. And so th what we want to do is encourage you to get involved with with a small group of people, and, and the, the only thing about the book is that it helps focus our thoughts and gives us some things to go through which are basic to being a better follower of Jesus. And so that's the encouragement. If you have this book, you've already bought it, then start. Get, get together with somebody who also has it or buy it for them. It's $10, and, and just get started. And I think it will revolutionize your walk with Jesus because you're, you're following it with somebody else. Also, life groups are for that purpose as well, to help us all become better followers. Now, before I start, um, I, it, you know, I really need to, to mention, I, on the way here, uh, I was listening to the radio and heard again there's been another shooting in our country, uh, this time in Baton Rouge. This time, uh, apparently, three officers have lost their lives. And we are... Um, you know, it's, it's difficult not to, not, you know, start preaching about that. So I think the best thing is to pray. And so we're going to do that right now before we get started. And, and pray that God delivers us from anarchy in this country. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as, uh, as one whose brother was in law enforcement for 30 years, this is troubling, to say the least. Um, Lord, we understand, at, uh, not on this specific case, but on some others, what has been driving this. And Lord, we don't want to, we don't want to minimize if law enforcement uh, goes beyond their limits. But Lord, this, this kind of thing in our country is not, um, not a good thing. We're broken, and we admit that to you. We are, we're, we're broken people. And, and so, Lord, it, you established government for a reason. You established, even in, in your word, you tell us very clearly in Romans chapter 13 that we are to pray for, and also in 1 Timothy, we're to pray for government, law enforcement officials. Lord, the people who do put their lives on the line to protect us, who, who stand between us and lawlessness. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray for the families who have been affected by this. We pray for police departments, sheriff departments, um, Lord, all around, all around this country. And, Lord, we pray, for, uh, we pray, Lord, that there would be healing in communities that comes from you, that we would see that we're broken and turn to you. It has to do with what we're talking about this morning, and so, Lord Jesus, Teach us from your word, and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, again, this, the, the topic of this series is apprenticing with Jesus. We use that word instead of discipleship because I think it describes really perfectly what a disciple is. A disciple is a learner. A disciple who is somebody who has attached him or herself to, to someone else, in this case Jesus, and is learning from Jesus. And, and what better word than apprenticing? If you are in one of the trades... Uh, you're an electrician or you're a carpenter or a plumber. You had to apprentice before you, you know, became proficient, right? You had to learn from somebody how to do this. And in a sense, we're learning how to become, how to become more like Jesus by following him. And so that's the, that's the series. Today, we're, and here's where we've been. 
So far, we've, we've looked at, at the command given by Jesus to love, one an- to love God and love one another, to, to obey. And then we looked at the command of Jesus to go make disciples. And then we kind of step back from, from what we do to, to how we think. And we've, the last two weeks, we've looked at what the Bible says about God and how he exists in Trinity. The, the purpose of this, and we're not going in order specifically, but we first have to train our minds, if we're going to follow Jesus, how to think like him. Jesus' thinking was informed by Scripture. And so we go to Scripture so that we can start learning how to think like Jesus, how, how to how to take life situations and put it into a grid that is the same one that he put his thinking into, how to think like him. Thinking then leads to doing, doesn't it? As a man thinks, so we, and, and so that, that leads into the things that we do to act like Jesus. Paul tells us to put on Christ in a couple of different passages in his epistles. And so we begin to act like Jesus. We, we begin to see his character and we begin to, in a sense, mimic him. In this case, it's a good mimicking. I mean, what, what better person to mimic than Jesus? And then that takes us in a process led by the Holy Spirit to where we finally become like Jesus. The final message in this series will be from Galatians chapter 5. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Did I leave one out? I don't think so. I think I got them all. That is the character of Christ, and the Holy Spirit builds that into us, and, th- and that when we are like that, we are like Jesus. It's as simple as that. And so that's, that's where this is headed. Okay, today, we've looked at what the Bible says about God as the existent Trinity. Now we're going to look at what the Bible says about you and I. Who am I? Who are you? Um, there's a couple of options, right? We can take, if you're sitting here today, you probably don't take the first option just for the sake of argument. Let's cover it. I have to talk fast today, too, by the way. So if I start talking too fast and you can't understand me, then, um, um, yeah, sorry. Okay. (laughs) Either we are a random and purposeless result of biological processes in an impersonal and purposeless universe. Have a nice day. All right, that's one option, right? Um, a writer, a, a Czech writer by the name of uh, Milan Kundera, who wrote a book called The Festival of Insignificance. How do you like that? That's it's pretty heady stuff for a Sunday morning, right? He says this, We've known for a long time that it was no longer possible to overturn this world or reshape it, nor head off its dangerous headlong rush. And again, today we have Exhibit A of what's going on. There's only one possible resistance, he says, and that is to not take it too seriously. Oh, good. (laughs) Don't take it too seriously. Kundera said this, and yet he thought things were serious enough in his home country of Czechoslovakia in 1975 to challenge the totalitarian Communist Party, of which he was a part, and it got him exiled into France. Apparently he thought that was serious. This brings us to a very uncomfortable realization pointed out by William Lane Craig and many other Christian apologists, and that is this. If we are not purposefully created by God, then we are, by definition, without meaning and purpose, are we not? If we are simply the result of random processes, there is no purpose to our existence. The problem is, and it's a very real and it's a very deep problem, we find that we can't live that way. We can't live as if life has no purpose. If you live as if life has no purpose, you don't live long. It results probably in more suicides than anything else I can think of. The idea that this is all a purposeless, and, and I mean nothing and neither do you, by the way. That's where this leads to, and we can't live that way. We, we, we know that there's something deeper. And so if that is the option we choose, we find ourselves in this very uncomfortable position of having a philosophy that we can't live up to, that we simply can't pull off. The other option is that we are a very purposeful and amazing creation of a wonderfully creative God. The passage in, in, at the beginning of this sermon today is Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 through 8, and it says, says this. 
The psalmist writing, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. That's Psalm 8, 3 through 8. Now the word here that we read as heavenly beings, you know what word that is in Hebrew? Any Bible scholars here? It is the word Elohim. What does that mean? It means God. Some translators don't want to take it that far. What it seems the psalmist is saying is you've created us a little lower, God, than you yourself, which, of course, is true. And, of course, we know we're made in God's image. We're going to look at that in a little while. There is definite purpose to our creation. We are a wonderful, according to Scripture, a wonderful creation of a purposeful God, and yet, given that that's true, we look at things that happen around us, like the shooting today, and like, and we look in ourselves and we say, what happened? Why, why, why aren't things rosy? Since I'm purposefully created by, by a loving God, what happened? So let's look at that, what the Bible has to say. What's important, why is it important to develop a doctrine of mankind? By the way, we are involved in a process called systematic theology. What does that mean, class? Syst huh? Okay, teaching... Uh, it. Thank you, Matt. I'm glad you're here today. Because if you weren't here today, the whole class would have got an F. All right, good job. <laughs> systematic theology is simply a way to describe what the Bible, what the whole Bible, not part of the Bible, oh, there's papers blown all over the place, what the Bible teaches about any given subject. And in this case, we're looking at what does the Bible teach us about mankind. And I've got 20 minutes to wrap this up, so we're going to go fast, all right? What is the whole Bible? Why is this important? First of all, it's important because it sheds light on who God is. We learn a lot about the Creator by what He's created. Just as we learn something of an artist by his or her paintings, we learn something of a composer by his or her music, we learn something of a writer by his or her literature, don't we? We learn something about who created that. Well, when we, when we turn inward, we look at ourselves and what the Bible has to say about us. We learn something about God. That's why it's important. Secondly, because it sheds light on who Jesus is. Jesus is unique in the Trinity because he and he alone in the Trinity, remember we looked at each, each, uh, each member of the Trinity is, is not separate, that's not the right word, is distinct from the others. Each person in the Trinity distinct from the others, and yet one, yet a unity. Jesus is the only member of the Trinity who took on flesh, who became human. And so when we look at ourselves, we also find out something about Jesus. And we learn a lot about humanity by looking at Jesus. Frankly, what we learn is, what was God's original intent for you and I in terms of what humanity looks like? That's an important part. Thirdly, because looking at us sheds light on the doctrine of salvation. Charles is going to be speaking to this next week. When we study the Bible, we see what it says that we, we learn that something went terribly wrong with us. We don't even have to have somebody tell us this. We know it. We have this sense of angst, all of us. We were wonderfully and purposefully created by a loving, creative God, but something went wrong. We've got this huge hole right in the middle of us. And we spend a lifetime, many of us, trying to fill it. Finally, because it gives us self-understanding, we learn that we're incredibly important to God, and yet we're still made of earthly stuff. It teaches us both to be humble and yet to rejoice in a Creator who considered us pretty important. Okay, so those are, that's why it's important. All right. According to the Bible, who are we? First and foremost... We are created beings. You and I were created. We're created. In Genesis chapter 1, 26, Then God said, Let us make man. Now again, we don't have time to go into the why is God speaking to himself in the plural. 
We looked at that already. But here he says, let us make man. Though Martin Lloyd-Jones, a tremendous preacher, mid-20th century, said this, though you are one of teeming millions of this world, and though the world would have you believe that you do not count and that you are but a speck in the mass, God says, I know you. I know you. In this verse, God says, let us make man. This is a great pause after he speaks everything into existence. The image is that as soon as God, with everything else, God created the heavens, the earth, light, and all everything that comes before this in Genesis chapter 1. The image is that almost that, okay, God is thinking it and then speaks it, and voila, there it is. God said, let there be light, and there was light separated life. He does all that amazing things by speaking it into, an, into existence. And then there's this pause, and God talks to himself. Let us make, it's even a different word used, let us make man. Second, whereas the previous account, the making of each creature is described as according to its kind, in this account of creation in Genesis chapter 1, it's specified that man and woman are made in God's image, not merely according to their own kind. Everything else made according to its own kind. Here, as God creates us, he says, let us make man in our image. And so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we're made in the image of God. We'll get to what that means a little bit later. Third, the creation of humankind is specifically noted as a creation of male and female. God made all the animals. They're kind of two by two. We, we find out that that troubles Adam all by himself later on, and it troubled God too. It's not good for man to be alone. Male and female is, is emphasized here in Genesis chapter 1. Previously, gender, according to the animal kingdom, apparently was there, but what, not that important to mention it. Now, we know how life comes, right? But when it comes to us, Male and female was considered important to mention, and it's part of being created in, in God's image. Both genders are necessary. It's not that God just said, oh, I think I'll do this now. Both genders are necessary. That gives both genders incredible worth. As I mentioned before, that's why we marry men and women. Because of the genders being created in God's image, marriage is a reflection of God's image to the world. It is, it is a very basic part of our identity according to Scripture. Fourth, only human beings have been given dominion. And then in Genesis chapter 2, 7, it says that God formed us. So you have these two words, make and form. Both words are kind of intimate words, especially this word formed. It indicates an act of creation that was by careful design. The same Hebrew word is used later in Genesis to indicate the intention of the thoughts of the heart here it conveys divine intentionality. God's the potter, so to speak, who perfectly works out his designs. He doesn't just speak us into existence. He makes us, he forms us. Incredibly beautiful term. We're going to look later on as he breathes into us the breath of life. So we are created as opposed to the thought that we are random happenings. If we're created, that means by definition purpose. If we are randomly here, by definition, no purpose. It's got to be one or the other, right? As we look inside of ourselves, the balance gets tilted way far over here. To be, we're created with purpose. We can't live without purpose. It's just almost impossible. Second point is this. We're created in God's image. Genesis 1 again, 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. It's not talking about your older brother or sister, okay? It's just animals. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. The question for all of us here, for all time, is what does it mean to be created in God's image? It's just stated here in this passage. But what in the world does it mean? And you can read volumes of books on what it means to be created in God's image. There's a couple of hints in this passage, 
and, and I think some other places we want to go here. First of all, there's two things in this passage that tell us what it means to be created in God's image. First thing is that it, it, male and female, the genders, I already mentioned this. It's right here in the passage. That's one thing that it means. We're created in a sense, in a unity, and yet different, just as God himself exists in a unity and yet has three persons in the Trinity. So male and female are part of the image of God. So husbands, wife, don't go, you know, don't go casting aspersions at your spouse of the opposite gender than you as if they don't matter. Remember, the genders matter because it's part of being in the image of God. The second thing in this passage here is dominion. We are, we are, we're caretakers, if you want to, if, if, if you will. We are caretakers of God's creation. We and we alone, in a sense, are given the ability to take care of things, to manage God's creation. It's one of the reasons he put us here. Part of being created in his image was to have dominion over it, to take care of it. And of course, sometimes we haven't done such a great job of that. Other times we've corrected it and done a better job. There are some other things that it means that are not inherent in this passage, but theologians have what they call, we've talked about it when we looked at God, the attributes of God. What is an attribute? Class? Huh? A what? A p <laughs> okay. An attribute is a description. It's basically it just something that's true about God. And it is a description. What is he like? And, and then theologians go to talk about what they call the communicable attributes of God. This is not a disease. <laughs> All right? But attributes that he shares with us, part of being created in his image. And then incommunicable attributes, which is things that we do not share with God, like omnipotence, omnipresence, things like that. But what do we share with God as far as what's true about us? There are some things that God has given us that he gave us because they're true of him, and those things are like life, personality, truth, wisdom, love, justice. We have this sense of justice that comes from him. And so we have the capacity for spiritual fellowship with him. All right? Don't have time to delve into a whole theology of that, but that, just let that kind of be indicators. Two things here, gender and dominion, and then the, the communicable attributes, love, justice, mercy, okay, things like that. All right. What else is true about us? We are both physical and spiritual beings. We are both physical and spiritual. How does the Bible describe God? God is love, of course, but what is, in terms of his being, his essence, what is it? Spirit. God is spirit. No one has seen God at any time. He is spirit. And that's why Jesus is so important because, as Paul tells us in Colossians, he is the image of the invisible God. When we see Jesus... We see God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so we have an image, an exact likeness of what God is like in Jesus. But in terms of God himself, the essence of deity is spirituality. Now that does not mean that he... You know, we saw Ghostbusters last night. But, okay, it doesn't mean he's this... Uh, yeah, it, it wasn't as good as the original, believe me. But anyway, it was our 33rd anniversary. So what do you do on your 33rd anniversary? You go see Ghostbusters. That's how romantic we are, all right? We did have a nice dinner before that. So when we think of spirit, that's what we, unfortunately, that's what we think of, some transparent soul floating around, and that's kind of how we think of God. I would encourage you to read C.S. Lewis and, and get his take on what heaven is like in the spiritual realm as opposed to this one. Uh, his, his take on it is that this is the shadow, that's the solid stuff. All right, and I would encourage you to think more along those lines when you think of God, when you think of spirituality. But having said that, God is spirit. We can't see him with our physical eyes. We are physical, but we are also spiritual. Now, I mentioned before that in Genesis 2 it says God formed us from the dust of the earth. He formed us. We looked a little bit about what it means to be formed. What are we formed from? Dust of the earth. All we are is dust in the wind, right? In Kansas, we are not, as, as Crosby, Stills, and Nash said, we are not stardust, we are going. We're not that. Apparently, we are earth dust. 
That's what God used to form us in that tremendously creative act. Uh, John Calvin, great theologian, said the body of Adam, by the way, Adam means earth, Adam in, in Hebrew, is formed of clay and, it's, and, and there's no sense to it yet. To the end that no one should exalt beyond measure in our flesh, we must be excessively stupid if we don't learn that about ourselves in humanity. We are formed of the, something very common, the dust of the earth, right? Now, again, when God forms something, it's pretty cool. What else? Is, so that's our physicality. That, that's the stuff we're made of. That's the stuff that, because it's part of this world, which is fallen, has to die in order to achieve eternal life. Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit eternal life, nor the imperishable inherit the perishable. These bodies have got to go because they're part of a fallen state. And it's painful. But... We have this other great thing about us, and that is we are spiritual beings. What happens with Adam in the garden after God formed him? What does the passage say? And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We are spiritual as well. We are a hybrid. And, and we're physical, and yet we're spiritual. And, it, and that... that it is a, a tremendously intimate thing. It's, it's as intimate as a kiss, isn't it? Breathe into his nostrils. The breath, face-to-face -face intimacy and, and a self-giving act. And by the way, Jesus, and it's no accident that he did this, as he's, as he's with his disciples after his resurrection, he met them, and he, what, did, what did he do? He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And so there's two kinds of life that I've mentioned before. We have this soulish human life, which is, spirit, which is immaterial in nature. We will exist eternally one way or the other. But then you have this other thing that comes in that God gives us, which is called Zoe. And when Jesus breathed it, it he, was, he was doing it for real, but he's also doing it symbolically, receiving the kind of life that God has which is always called in Scripture eternal life. And so we're, we're spiritual as well. We became living beings when God breathed into us. So we are both physical, which keeps us humble, but we are spiritual, which means that God has some tremendous plans for us. We survive this life because we're spiritual. All right, what else does the Bible say about us? It says we are creatures who became alienated from our Creator, from one another... And from ourselves, by willful rebellion, resulting in sin, which resulted in physical and spiritual death. That's a very long point, sorry. I don't alliterate points too well. We are creatures who have become alienated. We have this great big hole in our souls. We become alienated from God. We become alienated from others and even alienated from ourselves. We don't know ourselves. We don't get along well. We don't play well in the sandbox with others. And we run away from God. In Genesis chapter 3, the chapter I would like to take out of the Bible and all of the rest of the Bible is in response to Genesis chapter 3. After they ate the fruit together, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. We, we have this, and you have the intimacy in the garden replaced now by alienation. Now they're hiding from God. And of course, you know the story. Why are you, why are you hiding? Well, because we're naked. Yeah, you were naked before and it didn't seem to bother you, right? There was, there was something about this that... That, that before the fall, able to live this completely open existence before God, before one another, no, none of this crazy self-consciousness and, and silliness. No longer, we can't do that anymore. As we become more like Christ, we become more able to do that. We can put down the defenses a little bit, but now we're running away from God. C.S. Lewis talks about people searching for God, and he says it's kind of, you know, really... We're not. You say people searching for God is like saying that the mouse is looking for the cat or the cat's looking for the dog. Hey, here I am. 
Unfortunately, we don't really do that. We run away, and I call it the anything but God syndrome that people have. People will believe any ridiculous thing about, our, about life on this planet, about, and, and really intelligent people, but don't say that God purposely created us. That's absolute nonsense, right? Aliens created life here. We all know that. That's not, that's not nonsense. A loving God creating us, that is nonsense. And, and that's, that's just one example of how we run away from Him. And so we're broken. There's something wrong with us. And the Bible describes what's wrong with us. And it describes this alienation we now have from, from everything important, from our God, from, from one another, from ourselves. <laughs> Anthony, uh, Tony Campolo, a, a, a sociolo Christian sociologist, um, he, he, he gave a, a, a message on this topic, and he says, you know, we're all looking for it. And he's, he's from Philadelphia, and he's got this really saying, he sounds like he's from Philadelphia, too. We're all looking for ourselves. Well, what if we're onions, and we start peeling away the layers, and we get to the middle, and hey-ho, no one's home. <laughs> and we're all, and you, you peel away the layers, but, you know, we, we, we have a hole. Some great theologians have said, we have a God-shaped hole. And, and we're not complete until he comes and fills it. Next point is this. We are objects of God's grace and mercy with an opportunity to be redeemed through the sacrifice of Jesus. And I'm just going to read some of these passages here. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And this isn't in your notes or up there. I, I added this, all right? I should have added it first. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says this. Paul describing us says, And you were dead. That's not a very good way to start, right? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest, like the rest of mankind." Now, if you've heard me talk, you, you've heard me say that the wrath of God is not God throwing a temper tantrum. The wrath of God is His determination to do away with evil, every vestige of it. And the pro that's good news. The bad news is that I, I've been infected by it. And if He's going to get rid of it, He's going to have to deal with me. And He's going to have to deal with you. I know. I've met some of you. <laughs> you've met me. We all know this. No hiding here. That's the wrath of God. He will one day do it. And so we have a problem. God had a problem because He loves us but he, and He wants to redeem us. How is He going to do it? The only solution, and I understand that it's a narrow solution, but if it's the only one, it's by definition narrow, isn't it? There's no other possible solution. Was well, that God Himself. And so the next passage is this from Ephesians 2, or from Romans, I'm sorry. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the next, next passage, Ephesians 2, same as the first passage, and just now further on, after Paul says you were object of wrath like the rest, he has the greatest... He has the greatest word, but, in all, of the, in all of the Bible. It's a little word, but it means everything. So we're, we're, but he says, by nature, you're children of wrath like the rest. But, wow, I'm glad that's there. But, God, being rich in mercy. Mercy is that he didn't give us something we deserve. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together, breath of life thing, Zoe life. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace, that is, giving us something we don't deserve, his grace in kindness toward us, in Christ Jesus. And then the final passage, Ephesians 1, 7. In Him, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. We're broken. 
by sin, which brought death according to Paul, but God thought enough of us to redeem us. We're his creation that he loves. And he's redeemed us. Two more points. And because of time, I'm just going to read the passages with no comment. We'll let the Bible speak for itself here. We are creatures with a choice to be reconciled or not to God. Paul writing, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All this, and you'd have to go back to the context, see what all this is. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a choice you and I have to make. Next passage, or the next point is this. We are creatures who, if we have received God's gift of salvation in Jesus, will finally be fully restored to the life God originally intended for us. few passages here. First one from 1 John. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The word for life there in every instance is the Greek word zoe, not the word suke. Suke is the kind of life we give to our offspring. Zoe is the kind of life God gives. In every instance there. The next one, Revelation 21, 3 through 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And then later on in Revelation, Revelation 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of, the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the, of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. Tree of life, banned from it in Eden, pops up again in Revelation. Isn't that interesting? Finally, Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. That, folks, in a nutshell, <laughs> a very quick one today. And again, next week Charles is going to cover in more detail the subject of salvation. But that's who we are. Created beings, miraculously created in the image of God and yet made of earthly stuff but have been infused with eternal stuff. Not once but twice, if we receive God's gift of salvation and exchange our suke life for Zoe life. And then God has for us a future and a hope beyond our wildest dreams. The worship team comes up. Next step is this. Be reconciled to God by putting your faith in Christ. 
receive eternal life that God has intended for you, and then walk close to Jesus to become everything that God intended you to be as a human being. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for what it says about us. Lord, we, we, we see here that we are, we're the highest of your creation. You tell us that you make us just a little lower than you yourself, lower than God. And yet we're this hybrid of physical and spiritual, and it's enough to, it's enough to humble us, yet at the same time, thank you for, for the exalted nature of our creation. And yet, Lord, we also see and we feel that we're broken. And Lord, I think if we were truly random happenings from a mindless universe, we would not have this sense that things are broken. Why would we? And yet we do. Your word tells us it's a result of sin. It's a result of our own rebellion. But you have made a way for us to be fully restored. And all of those who are in Christ will someday experience that full restoration of what you intended from the beginning for us as your creation. Thank you for your unbelievable plan. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.